As mentioned in my previous video, George Peabody was an American financer and philanthropist and was considered the father of modern philanthropy or private initiatives. In other words, if you're wealthy, you can finance whatever agenda you wish, and they do so. We're going to zero in on Mr. Peabody because he represents the Hegelian dialectic or history repeating itself. While we look at him, we can see how it's the very same bloodlines and wealth that rule society. Mr. Peabody was the wealthiest American during the American Civil War, and yet all his money and interest was focused on London. Why? We'll come back to that. The common theme among many of the wealthy, especially in the United States, is to have an obscure beginning. They would like for us to believe their rags to riches stories. But we know better, don't we? We understand there is a brotherhood that functions very differently and that if you're in allegiance with this club or group, you operate with a different set of rules, and more importantly, you are chosen or selected. Keeping that in mind, let's outline quickly Mr. Peabody's life, or at least some of it. He created the Peabody Trust, the Peabody Institute, the Peabody Museum, and the George Peabody Library, and that's just to name a few. That's many private initiatives, don't you think? He was also mentor to J.P. Morgan's father, no less, a Junius Spencer Morgan. I wonder if they're related to the Spencer family in Britain, um, as in Lady Diana. Sorry, I digress here. So in looking through some of the articles at the Library of Congress, I came across this one from the Daily Worker, dated July 24th of 1926. The headline reads, The Story of J. Piermont Morgan's Fortune. It notes that George Peabody was the mentor and partner to Junius S. Morgan, J.P.'s father and goes on to state a lot more about Mr. Peabody. Allow me to quote here, quote, Mr. George Peabody and company were appointed the financial representatives in England for the United States government. Synonymously with this appointment, their wealth suddenly began to pile up, where hereto they amassed riches by stages. How did they contrive to do it? According to American newspapers of the time, their methods of accumulating all this wealth was within the pale of the most active T reason. And yes, I am pronouncing it that way, but you can see here the word I'm trying to say, um, and I have to say it like this, um, for obvious reasons. The Constitution of the United States defines T. Reason as consisting in citizens levying war upon the nation or in giving aid and comfort to the enemy. According to the writers of the day, the methods of George Peabody and company were of such a character as to be not only T reasonable, but double T reason, in that while in the very act of giving insidious aid to the enemy, George Peabody and company were the financial philanthropies of the United States government and were being well paid to advance its interest, close quote. The article goes on to provide an example. 
published in October 1866 by the Springfield Republican, for all who know anything of the subject know very well that Peabody and his partners in London gave us no faith and no help in our struggle for national existence. They participated to the full in the common English distrust of our cause and our success and talked and acted for the South rather than for the nation." Close quote. Does any of this sound familiar, like history repeating itself? To conclude this article here, quote, all the money and more we presume that Mr. Peabody is giving away so lavishly among our institutions of learning was gained by the speculations of his house in our misfortunes, close quote. A writer in the New York Evening Post, dated October 1866, made the same statements accusing Peabody and Junius S. Morgan of using their positions as United States financial representatives to undermine the very cause that they were paid to represent and profiting heavily from their treachery, close quote. So gaining a few more personal details of Mr. Peabody, we can start with that he was born in what is now known as Peabody, Massachusetts. He was one of seven children of Thomas Peabody and Judith Dodge, and was born in 1795 and died in 1869, with his final resting place being Salem, Massachusetts. You know, the place where the witches or the witch trials were known? His father supposedly died while Mr. Peabody was a teenager, and he claimed, of course, that he had the rags to riches story. However, it's been my experience when reading about such philanthropists that their beginnings are usually obscure with little info and that seems like it's with a deliberate intent. He began his career where he set up residence and office in the old Henry Fight house as a businessman and financer. But how? How could someone that allegedly was in poverty achieve that? In reality, we know that they can't, at least not the way they would like us to believe. We are told by the powers that be at Wikipedia that a developing nation like the United States had to rely on agents and merchant banks to raise capital through relationships with merchant banking houses in Europe. Only they held the qu a quantity of reserves of capital necessary to extend long-term credit to a developing economy I'm sorry, economy like the United States. Peabody began visiting England in 1827 and by 1837 had taken up permanent residence there where he lived out the rest of his life. Of course, after he established the banking firm of George Peabody and Company, which later became known as J.S. Morgan and Company in London. And in the 1840s, the state of Maryland defaulted on its debt, and Peabody, having marketed about half of Maryland's securities to individual investors in Europe, became persona non grata around London, which means a status applied by a host country to foreign diplomats to remove their protection of diplomatic immunity from and other types of. If this isn't an example of what we're seeing play out right now with our own current government, then I don't know what is. 
The Times of London noted that while Peabody was, quote, an American gentleman of the most unblemished character, the Reform Club had blackballed him for being a citizen of a country that reneged on its debts, close quote. And this, going back to the 1800s, is still the same narrative they push. Stay tuned for the last segment on Mr. Peabody, Part 3, The Business of Mr. Peabody. <music> 